fact, is a compliment to, to your science. <laughs> so thanks a lot for coming. I've heard that you've got time, so we would definitely like to talk to you. If anybody else wants, we'll just organize it after the seminar. So whoever wants, please, after the seminar, come round and we set up a schedule and it's very nice that you have time for people to talk to you. And then at the end, we also have a short presentation by Genomet, and you've probably already seen the booth on the outside. So if you want to have a look, please do so. Okay, with that, thanks very much. We look forward to your presentation. Well, thank you, Matthias. I hope you hear me well. To clarify, actually, Matthias' statement, it's very hard to pretend to be Australian because Australian accent is very difficult to, to mimic. So uh, the, the fact that I'm Polish is very obvious, I guess. Uh, when this seminar was suggested by Matthias, I thought it would be kind of an informal, short seminar. But obviously, since yesterday, it turned, it turned out into uh, something a little bit more official. Uh, so what I would like to do in the next 45, 50 minutes is actually, well, first of all, I would like to give you an overview of, of the main project uh, in my lab, which is uh, the DNA methylation and the effects of DNA methylation of phenotypic polymorphism. But I would like to highlight some of the uh, important problems that emerge in biomedical sciences. And I think there's lots of hand-waving and even hype in biomedical sciences. And we are, we are becoming extremely genome-centric. But it seems to be that we have no enough knowledge to transfer all those genomic data into, uh, uh, into something uh, really, really useful at this stage. So let me just go back uh, a little bit. Uh, in 1998, I published my last paper on drosophila genetics. It was uh, about the flightless region, which is at the, X, the base of the X chromosome of drosophila. One of the genes on, uh, on, on, on that region I called Vaclav, which is after Vaclav Gajewski, who, as you probably know, is a, is a very important figure in, uh, in, in Polish genetics. And his personality, his uh, enthusiasm, and his uncompromising attitude to science was, was, was very inspiring to many of us and certainly to me. So I thought it would be nice to give... Uh, I know, the name, one of the Drosophila genes after, named after him. Uh, Václav actually turned out to be a very, very interesting uh, transcript. It's actually a dicestronic transcript that is encoded by a long uh, sort of a mRNA that also has uh, a coding sequence for Bobby Sox. Václav is actually a GTPase, and Bobby Sox is a transcription factor. <clears throat> Why they are transcribed from one messenger RNA, it's not clear. There's also an antisense uh, non-coding RNA on the second strand. So I've done a little bit of work on that, but it was never finished. If, if anybody is interested in doing a little bit genetics on Drosophila, there's a huge notebook full of data ready to finish. All you need to do is a little bit of biology to understand the involvement of this dicestronic transcript, transcript in biology. But the, the real reason I'm, <coughs> I'm mentioning this is actually this. The whole flightless region is only 67 KB, 67,000 base pairs. It took us two years to sequence that region. We had, of course, lots of interesting genetics, uh, biology, mutants, uh, deletions, etc., etc. So the, the paper is actually quite interesting. But the fact that we, we had to spend two years to sequence just 67 KB, this day seems to be like a joke. But that, that's how it was done by the traditional Sanger Big acrylamide gels and lots of uh, manipulations and tedious experiments. So these days, that's, as I said, it seems like a joke. The genomes are now sequenced by, by a week. There's about 5,000 organisms have their genomes sequenced. Most of them are sort of simple eukaryotes or bacteria, but there's about a few hundred uh, higher eukaryotes already done. The thing to remember is that those genomes are sequenced in that sense that these are drafts. Most of the genomes are actually in very poor shape, and the assemblies are not complete. The Plytabos genome that obviously was done in collaboration in, in, with our institute is in very good, bad shape. The human and the Drosophila genomes are in much better shape, but still, there is only one genome so far 
that has been declared completely done. That's the nematode worm, Cynorhabditis elegans. The rest of the genomes are just trapped, and it, that needs to be remembered if you tackle any of the genomes and you want to get some information, it may not still be there. There's, there's an enormous amount of sequencing going all over the world. I mean, the US, European, and BGI in Shenzhen has already done about 40,000 human genomes. And there are already claims that the day will come when a medical checkup consists of a DNA readout. That might be as well true in, in, in 100 years, but at the moment, it, it doesn't seem to be really happening. And the reason for that is that we don't really know how to convert <coughs> static genomic data into biology. So we really need to turn raw data into knowledge, and we need a framework to do so. So partly that seminar will be about this sort of a point. Now, humans are not really a very good model for experimental biology. So I've been, for the last 14 years, studying insects and insect genomes. And I've, I've been a member of the consortia sequencing a few insect genomes there. The honeybee, obviously, and uh, the, the, the beetle, and bumblebee, and wasps, etc., etc. So that's that's lots of tedious work. Most of that <coughs> was still done using the traditional Sanger sequencing, so it, it's costly and it's uh, it's time consuming. So the honeybee genome was published in 2006. Again, it's a draft, not completely done. We still need to finish about 10, 15 percent of the genome. It took about five years to put the genome together, six million U.S. dollars. You could do that now for probably $20,000 in, in about three or four weeks. Now, the interesting thing here, if you read that small print at the, under the title of this, this was actually a very large paper, the last huge genomic paper published by Nature. But it says, a blueprint for social organization. We had no input on the, on the cover. The, the Nature editors wanted to add this sort of a slogan. And I didn't like it. And the reason for that is that if you take two genomes. One is of a social wasp and the other of a, of a, sing, of, of a single uh, uh, honeybee, for example, or the other way around, doesn't matter. If you have no prior knowledge which one is which, there's no way of telling which genome is from a social organism. We have found no clear-cut information in the honeybee genome about sociality. So the sociality is not really encoded in the genome per se. You need to find that information and somehow translated to, <laughs> to, to biological knowledge. So this is really the, the most important slide that I'm going to show. From, from the genomic data, from all the sequencing, that's what you'll get, a one-dimensional string of letters. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have an enormously complex organ. It doesn't matter whether that's, that's a human being or an insect or a fish. That organ exists in time and space with enormously complex development. In insects, actually, you have metamorphosis, so they can rewire the entire <coughs> nervous system and create an, from a larval to an adult state. They have behaviors, emergent behaviors, and, and lots of properties. Honeybees actually have a symbolic language, the only symbolic language outside the primate line, uh, lineage that exists. How all this information is encoded in, 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 in DNA? Somehow it's there, but we don't know. People are calling for <laughs> bridging the biological levels from genotype to phenotype, but really we don't know the, 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 the size of that gap. It's hard to bridge something if you, if you don't know the, the extent of that gap. So this is really something that I decided to kind of tackle many years ago and see if we can sort of get at least some understanding of how this sort of a static raw data can be transferred or translated into, into uh, biological knowledge. What is interesting that about 14 years ago, people had a very easy answer to that problem. And if you read papers around that time, gene number can be considered a pragmatic measure of biological complexity. That was the idea for many people, including Francis Collins, who always had very bad ideas. And what, what, was, what was transpiring from that is that if you have bacteria, they have 2,000 genes, then you have yeast, 4,000 genes, then you go to insects, maybe 10,000, 12,000 genes. Human beings being so superior should have 150,000, maybe 250,000 genes. And that was an idea that's supposed to solve complexity. But then there was a surprise when the human genome was published. People were kind of, you know, very baffled. If you take now from after so many genomes already have been made available, you have Daphnia. Uh, Plex, which is the water flea, and it has 31,000 genes. And Homo sapiens, with all these 
behavioral complexity has 22, around 22,000 genes. So there is a difficulty here. And it doesn't matter whether that's Albert Einstein or George Bush. They still have around 20. People in my lab would clearly say, no, he's missing a few, but that's, that's beyond the point. <laughs> Apis mellifera, the honeybee, has actually surprisingly low number of genes, about 13,000. <laughs> and a simple C. elegans, a very simple organism in terms of development. It's a utilic species. It has a fixed number of cells, only 300 neurons, has 20,000 genes. And plants generally have more, many more genes <laughs> than metazoa. So one clear message from that is that no simple relationship exists between gene number, neuron number, and apparent morphological and behavioral complexities of diverse organs in different phyla. If you take the worm and <laughs> the human being, they have more or less the same coding capacity in terms of, of proteins. But of course, the genomes of those two organs is dramatically different. The human genome is gigantic. So it has lots of this sort of so-called non-coding uh, uh, DNA. The honeybee is somewhere in between. But you can see the, the difference in the behavioral complexity driven by a huge differences in the, in the number of neurons. So as the complexity, I know it's difficult to define complexity in biology, but let's, let's take the behavioral complexity increases. Then you have less genes, bigger genomes, and more non-protein coding DNA. That, that is, according to a good friend of mine, John Matic, who is the main advocate of the RNA world, this is part of epigenetic mechanism. So the question that we try to answer is, how a limited number of genes can generate virtually unlimited morphological and behavioral complexities? There's one aspect that many people of the uh, animal evolution that many people seem to be sometimes forgetting is that the complex nervous systems evolved about 450 million years ago in a surprisingly short period of less than 10 to 15 million times. So around sort of a, the base of Cambrian, re relatively complex organs with, with good nervous system were already were available. So that, that very rapid uh, span of evolution of the nervous system put enormous pressure on the genome. There was no time for the genome to design and, and evolve new genes. It has to be done by a different, different way. So how to generate more from less? Of course, modular utilization of pre-existing protein domains is one way, and we know that there's only a few thousand protein domains, but they can be modularly reconstructed. Invention of alternative splicing, you can generate many proteins from, from the same gene. And of course, invention of flexible epigenetic mechanisms. And the concept of epigenetics is a very hot area these days, and everybody wants to explain everything using epigenetics. So wh why, why this is so appealing? And there's a flood of books, sometimes very bizarre, uh, with very catchy titles. Nessa Kari's book is very popular these days, epigenetic, The Epigenetic Revolution. The ultimate mystery of inheritance, epigenetics, ghost in your genes, and the mysterious epigenomes. And the recent book by uh, Elizabeth Finkel on genome generation, that one is a, actually kind of a bit of a worry for us because she put, uh, there's the chapter number three has the title Lamarck Returns. And she, of course, uses the honeybee work that we, we published uh, quite frequently. And already people tell me that all those creations and intelligent design web page using our work as evidence against evolution. So uh, he's, she's a very nice person. Uh, she's actually of Polish origin. She knows about 25 Polish words. <laughs> so each organism, or even a single cell, is a product of gene and environment interactions. We know that. So epigenetics, uh, epigenetic mechanisms provide an interface between genomes and environment. And there are lots of examples of biological phenomena that cannot be explained by classic genetics. So for example, the, 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 the so-called uh, Daphnia protective helmets that appear as a result of exposing Daphnia to predators. And they are not genetically driven. They can persist, but when the predators are gone, they, they sort of disappear. Of course, monozygotic twins, this Gordon's is another example. Twins, when they get older, they sort of diversify. Some of them, there are pairs that some one twin is, has schizophrenia or other disease, or, or uh, one is a smoker, the other one is not. So there's lot, lots of this sort of uh, evidence for environmental uh, input on, on changing uh, outcomes of those uh, 
clonal organs. And of course, there is a transgenerational, <laughs> transgenerational effects of maternal care, diet or drugs in mamas. This is still slightly controversial, <clears throat> but there's more and more evidence that that is also driven by some sort of a genetic mechanism. And there's one very important, uh, as far as humans are concerned, effect. So the question is how humans looking like this become this. And that, that, is, that is really something that is a bit uh, you know, concerning. And it, it, you don't need 2,000 years to, to generate such a huge change in the phenotype. In Australia, which is kind of interesting, when I arrived in Australia just about 20 or so years ago, the Australians were sort of a sporty, you know, nice looking people. Now they are in the second position as, as far as diabetes and obesity are concerned. So only the good, the good old USA beats us in this area. So that's interesting. And within about 25 years, the, the phenotype of Australians has dramatically changed. So now the, comes, here comes the, can, the honeybee. And, and the question is why the honeybee is such a good model for epigenetics and such a popular sort of a, uh, the organs these days. Now, Nessa Kari actually in this book you know, described some of the features of the bee and our work in, the, in chapter number 14, Long Live the Queen. And she said that honeybee is actually a, a truly extraordinary create, creature. Uh, the, the thing that she probably missed is that, and this, this is very important, the honeybee genome does not explicitly encode a specific organ. It has the potential to encode at least three quite different organs. So there are males, there are haploids, and there are females, there are diploids, but there are two types of females. All this is actually driven by environment. So the, the queen worker developmental divide is controlled by diet, whereas the existence of haploid males is, is also controlled by environment, the social environment, because these organs can exist only if the, the workers build special larger cells in which the queen will, will lay unfertilized eggs. So it's all sort of an environmental control. The, this, this type of organs are called eusocial species, as, as I'm sure you all know, often referred to as super organs. So this is the naked mole rats in, in Africa. This is actually a mammal. And termites, obviously, are another example. <laughs> this is the termite queen. This is the king, and it takes him about 20 minutes to walk around the queen. Uh, and of course, the hymenopteran insect, which is probably the most interesting uh, example of this sort of a, uh, evolutionary uh, invention. And it's called reproductive division of labor. That's a very bizarre but very successful evolutionary invention. So you have one reproductive individual, and you have 50 or 60,000 of sterile non-reproductive females around that, plus maybe 100 uh, males. So this, this is actually an exceptionally successful evolutionary transition. Only 2% of insect species are eusocial, but 70 to 80% of insect biomass comes from this species, and 20% of all animal biomass. And this is a, so, sort of a graphic representation of the, a proportional representation of animals in the Amazon jungle. So there is about four times by mass more insects than vertebrates in, in the Amazon jungle. We don't see some of them because many of, of those insects, like termites, live underground. The, queen, the honeybee queen is made, not born. Uh, and, and the developmental divide of this uh, situation is a striking example of context-dependent interpretation of genomic information. And I highlighted this, this word interpretation because that's for me what, about what epigenetics is about about interpretation of genomic information. So from one genome, uh, you can create two different organs by changing dietary input. So depending whether it's royal jelly or normal food, you're getting two different organs. And they differ not only by, by, by reproductive sort of a capacity, one is sterile, one is highly reproductive, but also longevity, one lives very long, years, this, this one lives just a couple of weeks. Membrane composition, the queen has a peroxidation, resistant membranes, anatomical differences, obviously, different pheromones, behavior. And as I will show you in a moment, epigenetic signatures of those two organs are quite different. So what we've discovered as a result of the honeybee genome, and we published a companion paper in 2006 in Science, that the honeybee has actually a group of enzymes called DNA methyl transferases. So these are key drivers of epigenetic reprogramming. And what they do, they sort of, by methylation, they create something which is called the fifth base. Now, there, there, are, well, there are essentially two types. Or in, in the past, people thought there were three types of those enzymes. 
So DNMT3 is the de novo metal transferase. So it has the capacity to, to add metal groups to, to the DNA backbone. Uh, DNMT1 is the maintenance o o enzyme that has the capacity to maintain the fidelity of, of methylation changes after replication. And this one, these days we know it's not actually metal transferase. It's the most ancient enzyme, but it, I think it lost the capacity to methylate DNA and it's now only methylates uh, transfer RNA. The distribution of this enzyme is quite bizarre after sequencing so many genomes. We can see that there's something strange there which we don't understand. Mammals actually have expanded this DNMT3, the de novo enzyme, so they have three copies of that enzyme. In insects and, and invertebrates, there seems to be an expansion of this one, the maintenance. But it might be actually that this enzyme has dual capacity because in, in those organs that have only this DNMT1, some of them still have the capacity to methylate. So possibly this enzyme has a dual activity, but that's not clear at the moment. And there is what, what is very interesting as well. There are organisms that have lost completely that methylation capacity. They're still quite fine. I mean, nematodes and, and drosophila, are, they have complex development and interesting behaviors. So why is that, that you can survive without that mechanism? Or, or in other cases, you need it. It's still not clear. Uh, DNA methylation is very easy to explain. I mean, it's just basically adding those metal groups to DNA. It's very flexible because they can be also removed, which is very interesting. In animals, it happens in this context. So only this C cytosine in the context of uh, CG is methylated. Also, what is important in mammals, there is the total demethylation of the mammalian genome during the modular stage, and then the genome has to be remethylated to establish an, a new epigenetic signature for, for a new organism. So it is a flexible genotic, genomic modification used by the majority of metazoan organs. So we, we, with this knowledge, we set up a number of questions for us. So how organs with contrasting phenotypes and behaviors arise from the same genome? How the genome is connected to the environment? And how this relationship shapes brain and behavior? How some types of environmental insults are passed through generations? And finally, we are also interested to understand how long-term memories persist in the brain in spite of a constant molecular turnover. We are assuming, and there's evidence now, that uh, epigenetic mechanisms are involved in this process. So the, the breakthrough came in 2008, as, as uh, somebody has mentioned. We published this paper in Science in the special issue on gene regulation. And it became a, a highly cited paper, I think, because it's still probably the only experimental evidence for what actually methylation can do. It links that process to biology. So it's a, it's a very tedious experiment. It takes three weeks to do that. If we inject <coughs> tiny little larvae with double student RNA, and we follow that in vitro. And in, you don't even have to wait till adults emerge. You can see the, the differences in, in the rate of development. So this organism, because it's already in pupal stages, will develop as a queen. And, and this one uh, will be a worker. And there is no doubt when they emerge as adults, because this is, I mean, you, you could do that easily. This is the queen, and this is the worker. And if you look at the ovaries, the queen is full of ovaries. The workers have no ovaries. So that, that, was, that was the result of this, of this study. And uh, in the control, we, in in vitro experiments, we had largely uh, workers and a little bit of this queen-like organs. When RNA treatment was applied, that was the complete reverse. It, 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 this is the kind of experiment that you worry about, actually. It's too good to be true. So we've done it about seven, eight times because we decided to publish that story. So in, the interference with DNA methylation uh, during larval or post-embryonic <laughs> development mimics the effects of royal jelly. So when the larva develops with no royal jelly, DNA methylation goes up. When there is royal jelly, that suppresses DNA methylation, and two different organs can be, can be generated. That is a very nice example of something called developmental canalization, and an example of epigenetic landscape. And if you remember Conrad Waddington in 1940, he proposed this uh, sort of a model. And, and this, this cartoon is based on, on, on his uh, uh, ideas. So this structure is a genetic hardware of an organism. These are potential phenotypes or outcomes from that genetic hardware. And this is a, a developing organism. And I just activate this movie so we enjoy the little ball moving down down the valley, and eventually it has to reach some sort of a developmental outcome. If there is a change in the environment, that may as well push the ball off the track. But what is very interesting, and, and, and also need, this needs to be remembered, 
that this is a threshold-based process. So uh, and this organ is reaching that particular uh, valley, cannot go back and, and change it. Once when it, this, this commitment has been sort of done, that's it. So it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a threshold-based process, and we see that <coughs> clearly in the, in the, in the honeybee. So we have, we have two phenotypes uh, driven by two different epigenomes, <coughs> which are very sensitive to diet, stress, and drugs. We can, we can actually do things to this development by applying all sorts of uh, environmental stressors, not necessarily diet. So from that moment, we, we decided to take advantage of <coughs> all the new generations, DNA sequencing technologies, and all the capacity that is available all, all over the world. And we decided to construct the, or get, get the methylation profiles from, from, from genome-wide uh, uh, extractions uh, and to understand the nature of methylated genes and also to characterize individual genes to understand involvement of DNA methylation in the regulatory mechanisms. So this is just a brief summary of some of those uh, quite tedious experiments. Here we combine microarrays, some computational uh, predictions, and what we found that about 6,000 genes are methylated in this organism, which is about 50% of genes. Uh, but what was interesting, that genes that are sort of very specific to, to a given tissue, like the brain or larva or antennae, are not methylated. But the genes that have become more ubiquitous are methylated. So, so the more housekeeping is the gene, uh, the more likely it's going to be methylated. So those genes show ubiquitous patterns of, exp of expression. And these are typically highly conserved genes, encoding metabolic processes, RNA binding proteins, DNA binding, etc. So those genes, typically referred to as housekeeping, uh, they were described as uh, uh, unregulated in the past, but clearly they are not. There is another level of regulation that provides sort of a, a capacity for the system to, to modulate their expression. <clears throat> and these genes cannot be switched off but they still need to be <coughs> adjusted in terms of uh, their responses to environmental uh, uh, changes. So this is the, 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 the brief sort of a graph showing what needs to be done next, so all the gigabytes of raw data, uh, transcriptomics, et cetera, et cetera. We collaborated on this um, expensive and big projects with the German Cancer uh, Center in Heidelberg and the UC, uh, University of California, Los Angeles. But for those who may not be familiar with the, with the process, to detect methylated cytosine, you need to bisulfide convert your DNA. So imagine that there is one methylated cytosine in this stretch of DNA. You treat it with bisulfide, the amination occurs, and non-methylated cytosines are converted into uracil, and then when you run PCR cloning and sequencing, you're getting a, a, a time in, in that uh, uh, position. And Obviously, you, you immediately realize that it's, it's a very uh, kind of a tricky situation because you're converting a four-letter genome into a, essentially a three-letter genome. So then you need really very smart people to assemble that genomic uh, sequencing and, and make sense of that. Fortunately, I have such people in my, in my group. So for each organism, there's only one genome, but hundreds of epigenomes of metalome. And minimally, you would expect one for each cell type. So far, we have sequenced four genome-wide metalomes in, in the honeybee. One is the, or two, is the adult brain in queen and worker. This is a post-mitotic non-dividing tissue. And then we sequenced the larval head also in queen and workers. And this is a rapidly growing highly tissue with high metabolic rate. So we had two quite contrasting situations here. Uh, just, just an overview. There, there are bit, quite significant differences uh, in the sort of methylation patterns between mammals, plants, and insects. First of all, the level of methylation is much lower in insects, about three orders of magnitude, which is good because you, you, have, you have a model in which the number of methylated sites is manageable. You can actually sort of correlate them with some biology, whereas in humans, it's, it's a nightmare to correlate basically heavily methylated, uh, all, almost all cytosines are methylated, and then sort of correlating those changes at methylation level in humans is very hard. The other thing is, uh, in insects, there is no promoter of CPG islands methylation and no transposons or repeats methylation, only gene bodies, whereas in Arabidopsis or humans or plants in general, the, the, everything is methylated. Basically, the genomes are just, just methylated across the whole, the whole sequence. <coughs> 
just a few examples how, how this actually looks uh, uh, for individual genes. So there's a few selected genes in blue, methylation levels for individual CPGs in workers, in red, in queens. And you see there's lots of differential methylation. There are genes that uh, are methylated in, in the worker but not in the queen. And you have genes also that have positional differences. So in this gene, for example, there's one position methylated here in the worker, but not in the queen, and, and, and this one the other way around. So, so that, that immediately suggested that this differential methylation is the key for us to, 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 to study. And we compared those uh, larvae and brain uh, methylomes, and we found that the number of methylated genes in those two different sort of uh, types of tissues is very similar, about 6,000. But the number of methylated cytosines is much higher in the, in the larval head. And the number of methylate, differentially methylated genes was quite spectacularly higher in the, in the larval head, 2,400 versus 560. So this is the key to, to, to that process, is the differential methylation. And the number of unmethylated, differentially methylated uh, genes also is much higher in the worker uh, larval head. Uh, and that explains why we were successful with that silencing experiment. When you hit the larva with uh, double strand RNA uh, for, for DNMT3, you basically stop of methylation in, in, the, in the worker. The message from that is, however, that there are no specific queen and worker genes. There, during the initial 96 hours of uh, larva growth, at least 2,400 differential methylated genes are involved in restructuring the, the entire developmental network. You don't need any extra genes. The same genes can be used complete, in a completely different context. Uh, one emerging sort of a very interesting story from the, the recent paper is that metabolic flux is probably the key driver of that methylation changes. What we found that those very highly conserved metabolic pathways are heavily methylated. So the TCA, the CAP cycle, TOR, and insulin, and ubiquitin pathway are all very heavily methylated. Don't pay attention to the detail. Uh, I just want to sort of make a point here is that this is the, the core of the TOR insulin pathway, which is important to transfer the nutritional information. And, and essentially, essentially, all those genes are either methylated or differentially methylated. Only a few, um, but they are not that critical insulin like peptides they're always there so they don't have to be regulated and the genes that are not methylated are actually duplicated genes so the ancestral form is still methylated but the newly uh, created uh, duplication is not there are two insulin receptors in the honeybee we don't know why the other interesting finding from that sort of uh, analysis was that uh, uh, anaplastic lymphoma kinase which is a very interesting gene it can activate nutrient independent growth and it's been recently published in Cell in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Drosophila. Uh, and this protein is very important to protect the brain during starvation. So if there is, a, there is not enough food in, uh, outside, uh, this, this pathway can activate a, a nutrient-independent growth and the brain will be protected, whereas the rest of the body is not that, that critical. So we, we, we are studying now this gene because it's also involved in certain uh, lymphomas, in cancer, and it's, it's a very complex gene. This is just to illustrate the level of difficulty that we are facing, and everybody is facing if you go to some of those uh, complex genes. This gene has 27 exons. It has an antisense message on the opposite strand, uh, which is a non-protein coding uh, uh, gene. Uh, part of that gene is methylated here. There's also one methylation site here. The gene is differentially methylated, high level in the larva, low in the, in the brain, but there are also different, differential methylation between those two different organisms. But what is really scary, when you, hit those, when you start to use those very sophisticated novel technologies like RNA-seq and whatever, uh, you suddenly discover enormous amount of variants. I mean, there's, there's unbelievable amount of uh, splicing, different trip prime and five prime ends, and all sorts of things that you wouldn't be able to see before. And that tells you that understanding and, and, and getting to the, to the core of this sort of regulation and genes implicated obviously in, in complex diseases is not that simple. What we believe now actually that uh, this methylation here controls this cassette exon, which is o o over there, and that changes the, the, inter the sort of a mode with which this protein can interact with other proteins. And to make things even worse, that antisense message is also differentially spliced, and there's lots of different uh, variants uh, produced from that part of the genome. Uh, 
So that brings us to the question, obviously, everybody wants to know that. What is the molecular function of DNA methylation? Now, in our case, because we don't have promoter methylation, that possibility that it just shuts down the gene as people believed in before, it's just a way of uh, activating, deactivating a gene, it's, it's not really uh, an option. So the epigenetic code, in, in, in our opinion, does not change the DNA sequence, but has the capacity to alter gene expression. And it's all about gene body methylation and the way alternative splicing and splicing is, is regulated. Now, this is one example of, uh, of the uh, genes that we are analyzing. It's a highly conserved putative transmembrane protein. And this gene is heavily methylated in the worker situation and not much methylation in the queen. This is about 6,000 base pair, the whole gene. Now, the gene model, there are two main transcripts here. And uh, the key difference between these two transcripts is that cassette exon or weak uh, conditional exon. It could be either inserted or not. And that generates two different protein variants. When you have, uh, uh, when, there, when there is no cassette exon inserted, the stop codon is here and the full length protein is, is, is produced. When you have a cassette exon inserted in that transcript, then you have a premature stop codon and the protein is incomplete and actually probably can even inhibit that, that full length protein. So we, we, we speculated that that methylation here, the heavy methylation here is to prevent insertion of that sort of a weak uh, conditional exon into the uh, worker transcript. And we did lots of sort of um, quantitative PCR and other studies. And indeed, that is the case. So L variant has a similar level of expression in queens and workers, whereas the S variant is much highly expressed in the queen. So that methylation prevents insertion of the conditional uh, little uh, exon into the worker situation. So it's another way of regulation. That, now, th th just to get to the biology a little bit as well, there's another example. Um, of the glycine receptor, and this gene has also a small cassette exon in this position, and all the methylation in differential methylation occurs around that cassette exon. It's a brain, brain gene and, and also expressed in the sensor organs. Now, we're still studying that in the bee, but we already know in the humans <laughs> there's a very similar situation. There's a glycine receptor that has 15 amino acid insertion in the long intracellular uh, transmembrane loop, and that insertion whether it's there or not, change, completely changes the, proper, the, the gating properties of the channel. So that small, tiny bit of, of DNA or, or, or protein uh, uh, sequence can generate diversity that I've mentioned before from, from the same genome. So the, the question is, of course, go deeply to this mechanistic sort of explanation and how does DNA methylation regulate all the splicing events, in particular the utilization of conditional weak exons. Uh, there was a paper published uh, just a few months ago in Nature by Shukla et al. And this is a very good paper, although people seem to be not noting that paper sufficiently. It's about the CT, C, CTCF promote, promoted RNA polymerase to posing. And CTCF is the, 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 the protein that recognizes that particular sequence. So they, they based that study on the notion that spliceosome assembly occurs co-transcriptionally, raising the possibility that DNA structure may directly influence alternative splicing. So this is a very primitive cartoon that I sort of prepared yesterday, just easier to explain. So you have a situation that you have weak conditional exon here, and this is the sequence that can be uh, recognized by that protein, which binds. And then the complex spliceosome RNA pole 2 pauses briefly, and then keeps going. As a result, all three exons will be transcribed and inserted into the final transcript. If there's methylation in this region, that protein cannot bind, and that will not stop the, the complex. As a result, that conditional exon will not be inserted. So this is the simplest and probably a bit primitive explanation, but that's how we see it. And, and all the results that we have uh, so far on splicing and alternative splicing support this model. So there is a possibility that all this whole methylation is about sort of a con controlling those mechanistically less probable situation, whereas the uh, exon can be either in or out, depending on the, on the specific environmental context. Now, Sylvan uh, Foray in my lab has done a quick test just to sort of computationally prove that point, and he divided the, uh, a few thousand genes uh, that are spliced into methylated and non-methylated, and did some analysis, and indeed, that's the case. The alternative splicing is at least twice as common among spliced genes 
that are methylated uh, than among splice genes that are not methylated. So there is there's also evidence across the whole genome that splicing uh, is, is, the, is, is the key uh, factor. Now, if you bear with me for another five minutes, my project is actually in a program. It's called From Molecules to Memory. So we obviously are interested in uh, uh, epigenomics and brain plasticity. And uh, uh, we are doing some studies on uh, uh, learning in memory in the context of methylation. What you see here, actually, this, this is micro X-ray computer tomography of the honeybee brain uh, done by Willie Reby. And this is a, an interesting character. He's, he used to be, actually, until recently, the rector or the president of the Liechtenstein University, every year coming to Canberra and trying to do this tedious experiment. There's a very expensive, sophisticated machinery at, uh, at our university, but the guys running that, that machine don't like this, this, this sort of a small, tiny insect being analyzed because it's, it's not a mammalian brain. And it's actually quite tedious. But anyway, so uh, in 1984, Francis Crick proposed that memory involves a system of modifiable dimers, similar in essence to DNA methylation. And in 1999, Robin Holiday in Australia proposed that memory trace is maintained actually by combinatorial methylation of individual CTGs. And in 2009, finally, the David Sweat's group provided sort of experimental evidence that memory processes are associated with increased methylation of certain brain genes and inhibitors of DNA methylation uh, impair memory form formation. So the idea now floating in this sort of a neuroepigenomics field is that DNA methylation actually physically stores somehow uh, a memory trace in the brain. Now, we, in the honeybee, it's the same. I mean, those enzymes are expressed at very high levels in the brain. Well, that is kind of interesting because brain cells are non-dividing, post-mitotic, so why DNA methylation will be there? Well, possibly for uh, uh, the maintaining uh, memory traces. We see expression or overexpression of those uh, genes uh, after learning, and inhibitors, like in the rat or the mouse of DNA methylation, actually disrupt uh, memory processing. So what is happening? So is DNA methylation and epigenetic regu regulation involved in memory processing in the honeybee? So we are doing the so-called Pavlovian associative learning. So we, we condition the scent and the reward, sugar reward. And it's, it's a kind of a easy done. You have bees mounted in those metal tubes, and you, you can see that the bee touched with sugar droplet extent this proboscis. When you condition that with the sand, you can then, like Pavlov did, did with his dog, you can expose them to a sand, and they will extend the proboscis. So it's, it's a very robust sort of a test for learning and memory. So we, we are studying now special temporal epigenome of the honeybee brain and trying to visualize DNA methylation changes related to brain plasticity. This was done in, in collaboration with the Free University in Berlin, who did the, the tedious part. Uh, so they, they, they're running those uh, trainings, and then we had five uh, trials uh, after, afterwards. And then we take, the, the bees are of the same age, so that's to remove the age factor from. So we take naive bees before training, one trial, three trials, five trials. And then we dissect brains into two different uh, parts. So this is the optic lobes. Central brain implicated in memory storage and antenna lobes. And then we extract DNA and convert uh, by, uh, by sulfide. And we uh, ampli uh, amplify dozens of genes. And we do the, the deep sequencing using the Roche 454 platform. And this is just a, one of the examples. So we do see methylation changes. Now, the, the, the brain of the bee has only one million neurons, and of course, the individual parts have even less. So if you get 2,000 coverage or more, you're basically touching tiny pockets of, uh, of events in the brain, just a few cells that will be uh, obviously involved in some sort of more memory processing of processes. Uh, associated with uh, memory trace. The idea, of course, was to, to see if, if what people say about learning and memory is true. So we, yes, there, there, there are methylation dynamics, and we see that. But what was surprising, it doesn't matter. You don't, we don't have to actually dissect the brain in different, different uh, sections. We could as well take the entire brain. So what is transpiring from that is that there are ways of differential methylation on the same genes, but in all regions of the brain. And that probably is something different that people actually propose. This is very early, but I'm, I'm just giving you a 
a flavor of the current uh, study. What, what we think is happening, the methylation changes reflect metabolic flux and energy flow to the brain as a result of that extensive training to which the bees were exposed. And the it may ne not necessarily have to do anything with memory trace being actually stored by DNA methylation. So I think we, hopefully we can, we can publish that, but that will stir again a little bit of uh, uh, probably discussions and, and probably uh, some people will not be very happy because they already were you know, quite sure that the combinatorial methylation of a given gene will be involved in memory space. So uh, just to capture some of the, of the, of the things that I said, uh, DNA methylation is utilized for storing epigenetic information, so basically kinds of patterns of gene expression. Uh, the utilization of that information can be differentially altered by nutritional input and other environmental stimuli. And the flexibility of epigenetic modifications underpin profound shifts in developmental phase with massive implications for reproductive and behavioral status. Uh, the honeybee system, in our opinion, brings a fresh perspective to the multi-level challenge of moving static data at the molecular level to that of the whole organism operating in real time. So I think we are in position to study such a transition from metalomes to neural circuitry to sophisticated behavior, all under completely natural uh, environmental conditions. And finally, the, the, the key players in this whole study, uh, Paul Halliwell, who is uh, British, uh, He's an expert in behavioral uh, experiments, also very keen beekeeper. Uh, Robert Kucharski, who also comes from the Department of Genetics. <laughs> Sorry, Robert Kucharski. Uh, <laughs> and sort of, uh, yeah, uh, good point. Uh, yeah, she is also from the Department of Genetics, and many of you know him. Uh, Sylvan Foray, my former PhD student, who is sort of uh, always uh, keen to help. He's an one of the best experts in uh, bioinformatics of uh, metalomics and, and genomics. One of the few people who can actually assemble that three-letter genome in a proper way. Gabriel Lockett, he's, uh, she did PhD with me uh, two years ago, and she did that uh, part of that um, uh, brain study. Uh, international collaborators, as I said, uh, German Cancer Center in Heidelberg has been very useful. This is an extremely professional and uh, excellent group uh, doing lots of metalomics on, on the mouse. But Frank is, when I visit him, he always says, yeah, give me another organism. I, I have enough of the mouse study. It's, it's so boring. So I said, well, we have, we have the honeybee. We have other creatures. So he's very happy with this. And Steve Jacobson, he's actually a plant uh, epigeneticist, but also very keen on expanding his research into other species. Uh, we have funding from all sorts of go government sources. Initially, at the beginning of this project, I had a huge grant from the Human Frontier, which was really very, very important. And we had a one grant from the NIH. Uh, okay. And this is where we are, for those who never were in that part of the world. This is the Australian capital, capital territory and the, the Canberra city. The university is somewhere here. And it's a very bizarre place uh, in Australia. And because there is no beach, there's no surfing, and it's cold during winter. So re and if you are a real Australian, you wouldn't like to live there. In fact, it's only politicians, uh, public servants, and academics like me still living there. In those mountains over there, there is a Mount Kosciuszko, or Mount Kosciuszko, as they call it, somewhere over there. These are the so-called snow mountains, and there is snow there, not, not here. The university was created by the Act of Parliament in 1946. So it's a very young university, if you can start to think about it. And uh, this is the, the building in which my lab is uh, uh, located, the school, research school of biology. It's a relatively large building with about 500 people working there. OK, if there are any questions, the answer will be the same. It's all due to epigenetics. OK, thank you very much. So, so it's been really an excellent talk, but uh, about uh, elderly people who are losing memory, okay, would it be, would it be a change in methyl transferase levels? 
Well, I didn't have time. We have a very nice uh, project on very old bees. I mean, old bees, like 90 or 120 days old. And this kind of working bees correspond to maybe 100 year old people. So they are very old. And the methylation level is about 50, 60 times lower. So they lose methylation uh, as they age. And the pattern of methylation slightly changes. Seems to be like uh, that, that's also gene position dependent. And probably because genes are not really a linear you know, stretches of DNA as, as, as we typically present them on the screen. But they are folded and, and the chromatin is involved. I didn't even mention a histone modification, which is, of course, part of the epigenetic regulation. Just simply no time for that. So yes, there is a clear cut uh, decrease or loss of methylation uh, with age. On one of the initial slides, you had the question how to generate more from less. And there were three possible answers. One was rearranging of protein domains. I don't remember the second. The last one was epigenetics. And, uh, but there was no non-coding RNAs mentioned. And well, there was. I mean, well, in the next slide, I sort of, uh, uh, when I was uh, showing the, 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 the extension or the expansion of the human genome, which is basically non-coding, and I said that there is no new sort of an idea, and, and, and you probably know John Matic is, is one of the key advocates for that, that, that non-coding part of the genome, uh, there's lots of uh, non-coding RNAs, and they are obviously part of the epigenetic regulation, so that's how we see it. So it will be part of the epigenetic system rather than an additional uh, uh, component of that. But yes, yes, of course they are. I mean, we, we, also, we have about 2,000 RNA-only coding genes in the bee. So, in addition, of, there's a smaller, maybe, number of protein coding genes, but there is two or 3,000 extra genes that code just for RNA molecules. The, the, I will go with the, the next question. Um, you, you said that the only genome which, is, which we can really say is sequence is the C. elegans. Yes, that's But I guess it's uh, among eukaryotic or multicellular? Well, no, that's right. I I guess mean, well, bacterial well, genomes I, are okay. Yes, that's true. I mean, I should probably say that many of the bacterial genomes probably can be declared. Although, you'd be surprised. I mean, I, I, I had a meeting with, once with a guy who was sequencing bacterial genomes, and he said most of the bacterial genomes are also like 95 98% Finish. And he says that that 2% sometimes that is left is not worth even doing because it takes 10 years to, to get to that little tiny bit to finish. So, in fact, many of the bacterial genomes may not as well be mm, finished completely. Some of them probably are, yes. But, but and, yes, that, that point is on the eukaryotic uh, uh, genome. And is, is, is this a fact that there is so many genomes which are partly um, sequenced? Is it a result of a quest for glory among uh, researchers that you can get a um, well, a science or nature it, paper by doing 90% yeah. <laughs> much less work than yes, 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 it's a good question. Uh, yes, partly I think it is a quest for glory to get, to get a rapid publication in natural science, although it's much more difficult now to publish a genome in science and nature. Uh, the, the honeybee genome was the last big cover genome that was published. Now they publish those short sort of like a, almost ads for, for the gene. Well, parametric. Did they have a cover? Did, did they have a cover? Yes. Yeah, okay, well, maybe I'm... Okay. But anyway, yeah, the, 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 there are two reasons for not finishing some of those genomes. Quite often, a community is too small to really tackle the, the, the completion of the genome. For the honeybee, we organized about 60 or 70 people all over the world to annotate the genes. And that, that was really a good paper, actually. Yeah, 22, pa 22 pages of reasonably good stories, and, and a little bit of biology. Some other communities, like the, the uh, bumblebee, the, uh, one of the hymenopteran insects, the community has already the assembly, more or less done, but they have only 20 people, and they, they're struggling just to annotate and finish. And sometimes the assembly is such a poor, in such a poor shape that people don't want to touch it. And real bi bioinformaticians don't want to do that because they know that would be just enormous uh, effort to, to get something out of that. So yeah, it, it, it's a very sad story that I would say probably 75% of the genome sit in a pretty bad shape in the, in the, in the genomic uh, database. <clears throat> uh, it's a, it was a very nice talk, thank you. And I have a question. Initially, you suggested that uh, epigenetics will be also responsible for a phenotype like obesity, things like this. So do you think that people who 
are a bit bigger should not invest their money and effort in trying to drop their weight because they are doomed anyway? No, 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 no. That's, that's not always the message. And the message is that you can change your sort of a, uh, a phenotypic output by changing your environment. And you can control that to some extent. I mean, what happened, is I gave the example of the Australian population, which was quite, quite amazing how quickly that population became actually you know, overweight. Because they, they, they have very good life. I mean, it's, it's, it's a country with basically no problems, or no major problems. And that, that could be probably somehow addressed. And so you can change, you can change your, uh, your, your environment, your, your lifestyle, your your food, the type of food that you eat, and uh, there's lots of other factors in the external factors that we don't understand. I mean, we, we now eat lots of processed food, so that could be also a factor in changing uh, you know, the, our uh, phenotypic outcome. We, we, we don't know all the ingredients that create this sort of a problem. It's, it's agreed now that it's environmental, it's a lifestyle, but I mean, there's, there's probably so many factors. It could be combinatorial as well, so you, you have no golden sort of a answer to everybody. Everyone probably will, will be having a different uh, sort of, a, or should have a different uh, recipe for, you know, addressing the problem. May I say a word about this? Uh, <clears throat> Helicobacter pylori, it's, it's something which is supposed to be a, a very bad thing, uh, which happened to the people. And uh, some uh, investigators are suggesting that this, uh, this species is uh, very important, sending a signal that we are just finishing a feeding. The problem with American could be that only 8% of child population that possess the uh, proper amount of the helico <coughs> helicobacter pylori. So maybe because of too much food, especially steaks, and they have too much antibiotics, so they have this problem. I, I think so. No, no, that's great. I mean, antibiotics, I mean, that, that's good that you mentioned. I mean, pe people now consume quite a large number of uh, amount of antibiotics. That kills your natural bacteria flora, and that sort of changes the balance of the, of the flora in your, in, your, in, in your gut. And that could be a problem. I mean, there's 400 bacterial species or so living in your, in, inside you. And some of them are probably very sensitive to those environmental changes, and then, then maintain your proper immunity, your proper sort of digestive power, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I'm sure Marek Niatkowski would be probably more, you know, keen to answer this sort of question. But I, I think it could be a problem as well by, by killing and, and, and changing or destroying the natural balance of all the mi microbial flora in our in, in our gut. Yeah. I'm afraid I missed the conclusion. There are no specific component of royal jelly which can determine the development. It's just supply, general supply of nutrients. I've, I've quite deliberately avoided the royal jelly story because that becomes, I mean, every time when I gave this talk and I mentioned the royal jelly, then it's, a, it's another discussion about royal jelly because it's a very you know, commonly consumed uh, ingredient as well and many people think that helps and I had a student who had a multiple sclerosis and she was eating enormous amount of royal jelly, claiming that that helps, that pain disappeared. No, we, we, it's, it, it's an extremely complex uh, uh, diet. Mixed. There's hundreds of different ingredients. Some of them don't exist any, anywhere else. So like there are certain fatty acids and lipids that are completely unique. Whether there is a one magic ingredient or it's a synergistic effect of the royal jelly, which I believe is probably the case, we, we don't know exactly. There are histone deacetylase inhibitors in royal jelly, and they probably have a direct effect on, uh, on histone methylation. That could somehow affect methylation because those two processes definitely sort of work in concert. But no, we, we, at this stage, no, there is no one clear-cut magic ingredient that would be, you know, identified as a, as a controller of that developmental uh, switch. Are there any synthetic substitutes for a royal gel? Well, if we knew the, the components, we could do. But yes, you can, you can make synthetic. I mean, some of the histone deacetylase inhibitors are now being synthesized by our collaborators. We, we treat larvae with those uh, components. But it... it, it creates problems for development, but we never get this sort of a clear-cut uh, switch from worker to queen. We, we generate some very bizarre insects with heads being turned upside down and mouth parts growing from there. So you can, the development is obviously extremely sensitive to external uh, stimuli. And you can do that by adding drugs, some, some other changes, yes. So there's lot, lots of different bizarre creatures that we saw when we added 
chemicals to, to, to those uh, grown larvae. This uh, glycine receptor is an uh, in synaptosomal protein involved in your transmission? Uh, no, it's not necessarily, no, I don't think it's uh, specifically in transmission because it's also in, in other uh, brain cells, but uh, uh, not, not necessarily. I think it's, it's just a glycine uh, uh, that is a, a, a neuromodulator, or, but it's not in the fast, if you're asking about fast synaptic transmission, that's probably not, not, not glycine. This set conclusion at the end, it resembles me... Uh, situation with uh, functional NMR of brain of patient, we believe that it has to be something very, very directly connected to the functioning of uh, neurons, but it seems to be a general blood supply. So you are in a very good company. Oh, okay. So that, that's good to hear, yes. Coming back to your flagship experiment with inhibiting DNA methyl transferases and making queens, you might then expect that if you take small molecule compounds for anti-cancer treatment, azacitidine, cebularin that you had on your slide, that you can get a royal jelly-like or DNA methyl transferase inhibitor-like phenotype. And I'm sure you must have tried this. Yes, we, we, we did a little bit, but we decided against that because those compounds are pleiotropic and then we sort of think that the effects then will not be that easy to explain. But yes, there are, there are zebularin is of course one of those uh, compounds of the type that you mentioned. This, this is a new, uh, more specific uh, component. And we're using that basically just to study the learning and memory uh, processes. So we, we're injecting rather adults than, than larvae. But yes, you can, you can get effects uh, with those compounds as well, yeah. So no. you can make queens in the absence of um, royal jelly? And not necessarily the clear cut. It's not going to be as clear cut as silencing uh, DNA methylation. Yeah, no. It's, uh, there's always something there. I mean, it's, uh, or maybe the conditions were not really that uh, well developed yet. I mean, you, you may have to. It, 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 I, don't, I don't think we need to repeat that experiment with all the available chemicals. Uh, I think there's, there's other things that can be done, uh, probably more interesting than... It, it, it's an enormously tedious uh, uh, experiment to do. It takes about three weeks of every day. Those larvae have to be manually handled and individually. They have to be cleaned, just like in the hive, because the workers do that for them. So if you don't do that, so it, they will not develop. They are very, very fussy and very fragile. And if you work with drosophila larvae, you can do whatever you like. You can take them, you can sort of roll them. And you cannot do that with the bee larvae. They disintegrate. You have to be extremely careful. So it's like changing diapers, because at, at some point when they start to <laughs> defecate, yes, you have to change those little membranes that sit under and transfer them gently. I don't do that, but I, I, I know it's very, very tedious. Yes. When Additional question on, on the same experiment. So in a way for the RNAi to, to work in this way, you, you need systemic RNAi. Mm -hmm. So you would expect it to be work in the worm, but in knowing that in Drosophila, RNAi is cell autonomous, you would actually not expect in another insect that the experiment works at all. So is it that RNAi is systemic in the bee, or it, why part, does it work? Partly, but yeah, the, the other thing that maybe I, sh I should have mentioned is that during the larval uh, stage, there is not much cell division. The, when, when we did the same experiment with embryos, they died. Within six hours, they, all were, they were all dead. We can do that in the larval stages because the larva is, is a very unusual developmental stage, not found probably in others. It's just an eating stage. The, the larva needs to collect enough food to survive during metamorphosis. So, so the larva just grows, grows, accumulates food. There's very, very little cell division. That's probably the, the, the experiment worked better than we probably initially anticipated after the failing of the embryonic experiment. So you, 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 you inject the larva, and the hemolymph basically distributes that, that double strand RNA in a reasonably low number, small number of cells. And that, because there's no more massive cell division in the larval stage, that probably has enough impact on methylation, it stops methylation, then the larval developmental outcome, outcome changes. There's more cell, cell division when the larva approaches the metamorphosis or, or pupal stage. Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, I think it makes me yeah. more understand. That's part of what it's impressed a, it's a very, me so much about the experiment. It's a bit different, because... the, the different situation than you sort of, when you're comparing this to uh, Drosophila or, or the worm, then, uh, then the, larva, the larva stage is something quite unique. And maybe that we, by accident, we hit the proper developmental stage to, to, to do that. Any more questions? But if that's not the case, then we turn to the Genomed presentation, and I would like to remind everybody that after that you can come round and we set the schedule for today if you, you want to talk to Richard still afterwards in person. Thanks a lot.